Hello beautiful souls, welcome back to another video on Starseed Academy. My name is Jenny and I'm here with you today to share a story, a personal story of a past life that I had on Orion. Now this is something that I've felt very nervous, even hesitant to share about, but my guides have assured me that it's important to share this information. The reason being that people need to know the history of our different star nations and how they affect Earth have affected Earth in the past and continue to affect Earth now because Earth is very important as it's the planet we're all on. We're all humans here right now, Earthlings, if you will. And these stories and histories and tragedies are still affecting us and they're still in our energy systems. A lot of star seeds are going to have past lives from Orion. It's a very big star system with so many different kinds of beings. There are so many different kinds of star seeds and beings in the Orion constellation because it's so big. And um, I've heard a lot that the series Star Wars was based on a lot of the things that happened in the Orion constellation and the Orion star nation and the Orion Wars. That's probably why I'm such a Star Wars super fan because a lot of it resonates with me. If this story can trigger your own starseed memories, awakenings, and energies, then all the more reason to share it. But for some reason, it feels important to share now at this time. So I have my journal here with me, which is basically like a template of the lifetime because as soon as it came through for me, I wrote everything down. But I just wanna tell it to you as a story first and then I'll, I'll go through all of the details and see if I missed anything or anything that stands out as being important. But first, let's just kind of go over the story behind everything because that's really what drives all of the details anyway. Okay, so let's start with me. So who I was during this lifetime was a female being named Avia. I was of the avian race as well, and I was blue but I don't really resonate with the blue avians um, when I'm reading information and looking at them. So I feel like maybe it was an offshoot of that or somehow a slightly different kind of being because even though I did have feathers, um, I also had like scales. So the body was humanoid. So just like a, a regular human body, but blue with the odd feathers, you know, details here and there. And then the face was all blue feathers with a beak and very large, wide, expressive eyes, definitely a feminine look. And I also had these scales that connected the beak into the feathers. So it almost give, gives me like a bit of a dragon feel. So I don't know if there is some kind of, um, I mean, I'm sure that there are beings that exist that we don't know of on earth. We don't know everything, there are so many. And so I don't know that I have a name for the kind of being other than it was an avian race. And um, Avia was of a noble bloodline. So she was part of a family of nobility. And we took great pride in our home on Orion, my family and I. So at that time, the reptilian race arrived on Orion on the specific planet that we were on, which was a part of Orion's belt. So the three planets across, I believe it was the one on the left and the stars called Alnitak. Um, but I, I don't want to confirm that specifically because I also feel really connected to the middle star. So it was one of the, the definitely one of the stars in the actual belt of Orion. And that's where we resided and my family was. So the reptilians actually came in as refugees. So from what, whatever reason, they were refugees and had no planet. And they came to us asking for help. And because they were such a powerful race, there was so many of them. And we were people that wanted to help refugees. Like we wanted to welcome them, you know, into our planet and into our home with open arms, knowing that like a conciliation between the two different kinds of beings and the two families could make an even more beautiful, more powerful, more um, advanced world. So everybody was full of hope. And um, both reptilians and the, the avian Orions, they were full of hope that the joining of the two different species could actually benefit everyone involved. And so because of that, to extend a hand of peace and of like a bridge of the joining of together, 
Um, my father offered me up for marriage to one of the young eligible reptilians. He was also, um, you know, equal to me in rank at, for whatever that would have been at that time. So he was important to them. His name was Ignu, and um, it's, it's a little bit even hard to say his name. It gives me the chills a little bit now. I, I am wearing my cloak of invisibility, and I have also a crystal with me for protection. Um, and it's because whenever I talk about this story and use his name specifically, I've had um, reparations in the astral realms and in the dream space where they kind of come after me a little bit. And um, maybe I'll talk about that at the end of the video if there's still some time and what I've done to ease that situation. But it does, I don't want to give it more power than it has, but it's just a little bit um, scary because, you know, there's still that connection between the two of us and our history together in that relationship was so volatile. So here's what happened. So we were married and everybody was full of these high hopes. And I really did welcome him with open arms and I did love him. I really wanted that. I really wanted all of the things that my father believed in for our land and our country. And I was really good and very empathic at seeing the good qualities of people. And so I decided to see those qualities and to love that being for the potential that was there. We had a child and it was a son and he was a beautiful joining of the two and we both loved him deeply. Ignu and myself both loved this child like crazy. He was very young, he was only, you know, maybe a, a month or two old, couple of months maybe, and he fell ill. He became very sick and we were both very distraught and worried. When this tragedy struck, Ignu lashed out with a side of himself that I hadn't seen, with ferocity and anger. He closed his ears and his heart to me. He started to blame um, the avian race because there were a lot of people coming and going that wanted to meet the new little prince. Um, they didn't call him a prince, the little baby, because we didn't have terms like that but he was very important to both of the species and to the kingdom and the coming together of the two. And so there was a high amount of traffic going through and of people visiting and a lot of love being shared and acceptance and again, that, that sense of hope. But after the baby fell ill and it seemed as though he wasn't going to get better, Ignu started blaming the people and their children for coming too close to his son, for contaminating him, and for being the cause of the illness. We did eventually lose our son and the loss curdled in his heart into anger, blame, and rage. And at first it was fear and sadness, but it very quickly was morphed into this darker force. And because he blamed the children and their parents, eventually he blamed avians all. He started searching for ways to control his surroundings and his life to quell those fears and that sadness. And I think that he believed that if he could control the life situation and people around him, that he would never have to feel or experience such a loss ever again. Of course, this is not growth. This is not freedom. This is putting yourself in jail into prison where you're trying to defend yourself and protect yourself from life itself. At that point, he left uh, me, Avia, and the home that we had together, and he began to spread this hate for the avian race amongst his people and his troops. Um, he was a military commander of sorts, and he used that position to start little wars at first, um, little battles, uh, and it just grew and grew and grew into a much larger scale war that eventually decimated the entire planet. I remember feeling so completely betrayed and abandoned. Not only did I lose my son, but I lost my husband 
and now I was losing my people and my home. It was very devastating and very traumatic and there is no real way to um, absorb that amount of betrayal and loss. There was a great war. Many citizens were lost. I remember a lot of violence and fire. There was no more respect from the reptilians of our planet and its resources. They started um, getting like a very greedy desire for more, more all the time, more this, more that. Um, and the planet was stripped of most of its resources in a very short period of time. It was mostly because they wanted everything for themselves and they no longer wanted the avian people to have anything. And so they wanted them to be cut off um, from life. We were very connected to our planet as a people. We felt her spirit and we had a lot of respect and love for her. So when they ravaged and raped our planet, our home, for everything that she had and took it against her will, that rippled throughout the people. We felt that. It echoed throughout the Orion people of this avian race and they, it sparked an uprising, like they were no longer going to play peacemakers and try to make things better. Now they just wanted to do everything that they could to get rid of these reptilians that they had at, at one time welcomed so warmly in as refugees. And now they wanted them off their planet in time to save their planet. At a very short time later, there was not much left that the planet had to offer to her citizens. And so it wasn't hard to get the reptilians to leave um, there was nothing to stay for and essentially they fled and left the citizens behind to perish and they couldn't save their home and they couldn't save themselves and the reptilians who had made Orion their borrowed home and who had been welcomed with such open arms turned on her for their promises of power and their desire for more and their desire for control and a new desire to control a lesser race or what they deem to be a lesser race and they left and they went to earth. I stayed behind with my people. I knew what that meant and that we would not make it, we would not survive and that there was no, we were beyond being able to regenerate the planet at that time. Essentially the planet had been stripped and robbed of life itself and so it couldn't sustain anyone and so that's where the story part ends. I mean, it was one of the worst parts of remembering all of this was how much we hoped and how much we gave and how much we opened our hearts to these refugees and to be so betrayed by them. And ultimately the biggest loss of all that I felt, even though I lost you know, my family, my child, all of that, it was the planet. That's what really bothered me the most was losing our home because it was something that you could never go back to then. I mean, once a planet is gone, I don't know that you can regenerate it. And I don't know then even on another incarnation if I can ever go back there. So that sense of loss was so much deeper because um, the spirit of the child that I lost lives on, the soul lives on. And interestingly enough, is a beautiful, beautiful angel and a guide of mine named William. And when I understood and had this past life come through, oh, it explained so much to me about William. Like a lot of the reasons why he never speaks, he was so young when we lost him and he is just like such a comfort to me. He's always just hugging me and loving me and sending me like physical comfort. And I just find that really interesting now knowing the background there. And he wanted me to know that, you know, if I ever did decide to have a child in this lifetime, that he would be the one to come through, that it would be him. So that's pretty cool. So after the story came through to me, um, it comes through, you know, as a replaying like a movie. And it doesn't come through with like names and labels. It just comes through like you're just living it in the day as that person. Like I was Avia, I was living through it and experiencing all of the emotions and feelings that she was going through and all the shock and hurt at the betrayals. Um, but as for like historical accuracy, um, like I said, I'm not certain which star it was in the Orion's belt, but I know that we were in, I think the left or the center one to start. But now looking at like historical um, events and details, 
I believe that once Ignu and I were betrothed to each other to be married, that we moved to start up like a new society of the blend of the races. And so like our closest companions and family um, and our friends and whoever really wanted to, I guess, would have followed us to this new planet uh, where we would start like a new society of sorts. And that is the planet that was stripped of its resources and destroyed. I think that that possibly fits a little bit more with the historical details and accuracy of a planet actually dying, which would be the planet Maldek. Um, and I do feel like that planet had a very tragic end. And I know that the reptilians were involved and that there were wars involved. So I don't know for sure because like I said, when past lives come through, they don't always come through with like the labels, the details and the specifics. They come through with what you need to heal. So the things that you need to work on to heal. And so for details sake, really all I had was um, that I was, you know, living on Orion and that I, my name and my family and what I look like and what, you know, happened with the marriage and the child and the loss and the reptilians and the wars. So whether or not that was a planet within the Orion's belt, one of the smaller stars, or whether or not that was the infamous planet Maldek that was destroyed, in, in whatever the case, the details of the story remain true in that a planet was lost in this war. And that was so devastating to all of us that were so connected to that planet with our love. So I see now a lot of the... Um, points in that past life bleeding through into this lifetime. Um, for instance, I always pursued and had um, in the male relationships in my life, whether that be family, friends, or like romantic relationships, they were always very domineering. Um, they were always very controlling. And a lot of them resulted in abandonment over the smallest things, over the smallest um, fights, it seems. It's also, I think, one of the main reasons why thus far, I've pretty much chosen not to have children in this lifetime. I think that, you know, you can pretty much see and understand why I wouldn't want to do that again. And, you know, having William in my life as a guide is enough for me. And I just love knowing that we have that past and that connection together. It also explains to me why the constellation of Orion is the first thing to grab my eye in the night sky before I even knew any of this before I knew I had a past life there, it was so special to me and I was fascinated by it. Every night, just look for it in the sky and sent prayers its way and, and you know, sent a lot of love that way. I think this is also why the reptilian story feels so personal to me. Um, many years ago, uh, like 10 plus years ago, when I first learned about the reptilians and had these memories, a lot of these memories triggered, it felt so terrible to me in such a personal way, like I somehow had played a part in it or, you know, that somehow I was involved, uh, you know, personally with the story of the reptilians coming to Earth as a controlling force. And so it was, you know, it hit me a lot harder than most people that would just hear about that, you know, as chilling and sad and scary as it is, it was so much more to me, like it felt really personal. This is also one of the main reasons I believe that I've come to earth this time around. Um, one of the main pushes for me to come to earth is to try to stop this from happening again. The wars, the waste, and the eventual abandonment of an entire planet. I just, I can't stand to think of that ever happening again to anyone going through that ever again. Since this story has come through for me and I've been working with the healing and the energies of Orion and of my avian family at the time, I've had my brother come through and his name is Othala. He is now a part of the Orion Council of Light working with them to bring balance back to our parts of the universes. When Othala first came through to me, he came through with a lot of guilt um, he came through with a lot of sadness and apologies to me, which I didn't understand at first until he showed me his part of this past life story and his role. And he felt that he had abandoned me to the reptilians in a sense. He also felt really terrible because I guess he was, you know, very close with Ignu and they became fast friends. 
And when Ignu first started his mission for control, creating like a, a, a bigger, grander species and having control over the lesser um, species and beings and, you know, being the ruler of them and how that was actually going to be better. I guess Othala didn't see it for what it was and followed along for a while, even going so far as to follow the reptilians to Earth for a short time. And once he realized that he had made that mistake, it was something that he carried around with him in his soul as like a, a huge guilt that he was a part of any of that. Um, but it wasn't just reptilians. Igni was uh, very charismatic and he had a lot of believers and followers in the things that he spoke of and preached about. And I don't blame them. I think I saw a side of Ignu that a lot of people didn't see being in the behind the closed doors. And so I was a little bit more uh, aware of the darkness within and how it had twisted him, how that loss had churned in him and completely twisted him uh, from what he was originally into something so much darker. And so I don't think that he showed that side of himself. Why would he, right? So he had a lot of followers, not just reptilians, and following him because he was promising them all, all kinds of things. And so Athala had a lot of guilt when he originally came through. He, you know, admitted everything to me and showed me all of these um, flashes of the things that he was doing and sorry for and what it resulted in. And then he asked me to look up the meaning of his name. And here's where we go down the rabbit hole a little bit. I looked up the meaning of the name Othala and Othala is actually a symbol of a ruin from the Druid times. So if you don't know what ruins are, I don't mean like old buildings. I mean like they used them as you would use like Oracle or tarot cards. So ruins are symbols carved onto stones that you would like shake up and then cast and then derive a meaning from the way that the symbols are shown and placed and all of that, just like tarot or oracle cards. So his name, Othala, is one of those ruins from the Druid times. And his name means nobility, owning of property and abundance. And the light side of the Othala ruin, because everything has a light side or a dark side, everything has polarity. So in, when it's in its light and in its higher self, um, it's about sharing with the many. But when it's in its darker side or its darker self, it's about hoarding and insisting on purifying of the land and the people. So he you know, fell off of his balance and got into that darker side of himself where it was, instead of about sharing, it was about hoarding everything for the few instead of the many. So a very similar theme that we see today with the elites on the earth, hoarding everything for themselves, keeping it all for the few and not sharing it with the many. And so let's just go a little further down this rabbit hole. So the Nazis used the symbol of Othala originally on their flags and in their beliefs they used the symbol to represent themselves so needless to say when i came across this information on the internet i was like shocked so then i had this shown to me from othala and also from my own higher self memories of the reptilians and the nazis having like a connection and that they would meet together in inner earth. So inner earth is exactly what it sounds like. It's where you go deep within the earth and there are beings that live within the planet earth. And there are a lot of reptilians down there. So the reptilians saw um, the Nazis and the Nazi leader saw what they were trying to create and wanted to help them to empower that, obviously for their own means because of the selfishness of it all. But so they brought them actually down into inner earth, which is underneath the surface of Antarctica. And at that time, the reptilians gave the Nazis knowledge and information on how to control others and essentially how to take over. Finding all of this information out 
Um, like I said, Othala was extremely sorry and um, very like, he felt a lot of guilt and regret for his part in it all. And especially for his, you know, name to be this symbol that, you know, the Nazis were using to represent themselves. And like, that isn't who he is. It's not his truth. Everyone goes through dark times. Everyone gets lost. Everyone has their dark night of the soul. And this is something that he now has to live with and carry around with him. But he has turned towards the light and he is working with the Orion Council of Light. Unfortunately, at this time, Ignu has not seen the light. I have spoken with him. I have tried to work with him and I've forgiven him. And I told him that. I let him know it's so important to do the shadow work. And this is what I'm talking about when I say shadow work is not easy. It's intense, but I did find it after a time. I found it within myself to forgive him and to have compassion for him and everything that he's been through. And when I arrived at that place, um, we did have a meeting. So I was having a meeting actually with the Galactic Federation of Light. We were talking about this past lifetime of mine and how I could use it now on earth to do good and for healing. And Igmu actually just showed up. Like he just popped out of nowhere. And everyone in that meeting went really still and quiet and, you know, weren't really sure what to do. I felt like my personal guides like wanting to come and protect me right away, but I wanted to speak to him. So I, I directly asked him what it is that he was trying to accomplish. I told him that I forgave him and that it wasn't his fault what happened and the tragedy that he went through, that we went through together. I said, it was never your fault and I forgive you and I'm really sorry. I asked him to please set himself free by going back to that day in his heart and reliving and going through those emotions again to release and heal them. I let him know that every soul chooses and yes, William, our son, did choose to experience that lifetime and that he was safe and sound and that if he wanted to, he could speak with William, the soul that he was and the angel that he was now in this lifetime. I let him know that William was you know, safe, that this soul was not lost forever, the soul of his son, that he was actually now a beautiful, regal and powerful angel. I then told him that I thought Earth had earned her freedom and I asked him to let her go to let go of earth and let go of her people, to please release her. I told him that I chose to come here to shine my light on all involved and to shine the light of source and the love of source on all beings, on earth herself and even on him. I told him that I loved him and that I forgave him. And I asked him why he continued on with this quest for control what is it that he was after? And he walked over to the table that I was sitting at and he slammed his fist down on the table and screamed the word more. Like that's what he wanted was just more in general, more of everything. And I was like startled and frustrated and like the, the slamming of his fist and his voice like reverberated throughout the whole place and everyone was kind of shook up, but that's what he was going for. To use his aggression again as a means of controlling people, to scare people into listening to him and you know agreeing with him and or at least not questioning him. And I wasn't about to go for that. I wasn't about to fall for that again. So I grabbed his arm that he had slammed down on the table in his like aggressive act. So I grabbed onto his arm and I immediately transported us both to the source. So we were then instantly standing on the doorway of source and behind us was this beautiful doorway of light where the source of all existed. And of course, pouring out of that is just like everything that you are, the unity and the oneness and the love and the power of it all. And the true power of oneness is that we are all connected because we are all from the same source. We are all a piece of that source, that spark within us. There is nothing more powerful or more able to create change than oneness. That is the true power. And so I wanted to show him that. So I brought him to this doorway of source 
and we felt this like emanating off of it. And I just said like very determined, like that's the more. The more that you are saying, claiming that you need in your life, that you're spending lifetimes chasing after, it's right here for you. It's available to all of us and it's more powerful than anything that you're creating in the darker, more negative ways. You could never create anything as the limited being that you are that is more than that. This is the more. Have it. Like, enjoy. Like, what, what more are you looking for? This is the more. This is all there is. Would you believe that his reaction was to roll his eyes and disappear? He just disappeared. He astraled right out of that space. And so I returned to the council meeting that I was in before we were interrupted. He wasn't there. He, he had just left completely. And their faces, oh my God, their faces were all so shocked. Like, what did you just do? But they were kind of like slightly entertained by like the bravery and the courage of it all for me to stand up to him and to take him somewhere where the more actually was and existed and the power of it all and say, here, you want more, here it is, and it's available to you. So now what, what's your excuse for acting the way that you're acting? And like, obviously, I don't think I really got anywhere with that, but it's important to stand up for yourself and it's important to um, walk your talk, right? And be all that you preach. So I don't know, I guess long story short, Earth is going through something that I've seen happen before and there are these covert forces hidden within the elite where the few are trying to hoard everything for themselves and control the many and I, that's exactly the same society that we're looking at on earth so it's chillingly familiar for me and I'm really determined to be a part of breaking it up and pouring the light in because even though polarity is necessary between light and darkness, there still needs to be a balance. And we are far, far imbalanced into the dark at this point on Earth, where free will is really being tampered with and taken from people through the covert actions and manipulations that we see and we don't see. The majority of souls on Earth are not in the know. They don't realize what's going on and it's time for them to become awakened to the fact that we are being controlled through the media, through our food, through the things that they spray in the sky, through things like fluoride and how it calcifies your pineal gland and cuts you off from source and your connection with your guides. Anything that they can do to cut you off and make you feel small and weak and alone. Starseeds and lightworkers are here for exactly this reason to shine the light, to spread the information, and to empower the souls on earth back into a place of balance so that they have a true choice, the free will choice, if they want to you know, lean towards the darker negative vibes or the lighter higher vibes, they at least have the choice and the information and the awareness that those two exist and that there is a choice being made at every moment in your life. So this is some dark, heavy information, and um, I think that you can see all of the different reasons why I felt it was important to share this lifetime and this information. And it's about the energies and the stories underneath. It's important not to get caught up on details. It's important to see the similarities between that story and what's happening on earth right now and for us to empower ourselves and do everything that we can to bring the light and the information of source and the love of source back onto earth now. So if you liked this video, please like it. And if you want to share this video, um, just know that you might face some backlash for sharing something like that. So I'm not naive to the fact that there are going to be people that don't want this information out there. Uh, they don't want me talking about it and they don't want it being shared. But if you feel inclined and ready and courageous enough to start talking about these very real things that are happening now, then please do share it. I encourage you to use your intuition when it comes to your life and to start to look 
at all of the choices that you're making and make sure that you do have your free will in front of you and that you can clearly see that you're choosing and not being manipulated or coerced into any of your decisions. Your free will is important. Your free will matters. It matters to me. It matters to all of us. We all need to take care of each other and look out for each other. So anyway, please subscribe to my YouTube channel for new videos every Sunday, Monday, Wednesday. Come check out Facebook and Instagram for daily content. And as always, listen to your heart and the quiet voice within. You are so much more than the body you are in.